Hello, my name is Rick Moore, and today I'm your host for Write, and I'm interviewing author Jude Matlitz Hall again about her book, The Everstream Chronicles. There it is. The Everstream. <laughs> How are you doing, Jude? <laughs> good. I'm doing good. Good. All right, let's uh, begin. Um, the opening scene is classic for The Everstream Chronicles. Describe it for our audience. The woman's line, no, no, this won't do, is beautifully put. Ah, so. so describe it. I had a lot of fun with this scene. So it starts, you you think it's just going to be your average mystery noir story. Um, this dark streets, dark rainy streets, a woman in patent shoes is <laughs> with her dripping fur coat is running through the streets, desperate, damsel in distress, goes <laughs> to the um, the detective's office. And, you know, it's the whole just buxom... Right. You know the slip the the coach slipping off her shoulder she swings her leg out to seduce the detective so that she gets her way and you know the detective is speechless and you you don't see the detective because the office is very dark and there's just this one lamp illuminating the handwriting and right. um she slams her hands on the desk and she spills out her story and asks for his his help <laughs> <laughs> and uh and then the detective finally fumbles and speaks and the woman is surprised because and shines the light on the detective and the detective is a young swarthy skinned lady <laughs> 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 and so she's penelope o'connell the woman was looking for sean o'connell and who who um, uh, is Penelope's grandfather, and uh, and so the line, uh, it's a I, I really loved this scene because you know Penelope, um, her compassion really comes out. So right off the bat, I make it clear that uh, you know she's a very compassionate character. Uh, Penelope's right. a very compassionate person, and so even though she's she's taken aback because the woman treats her so badly. Um, and, and that kind of, you know, women treating other women badly, you know, is, it's an old story, right? Um, and so, but even, despite that, Penelope sees that the woman needs help and still offers her help. And, but the woman, she, she can't, she can't accept it. She can't accept that some, you know, man is going to come to her rescue she can't she can't have a young lady come to her rescue oh no no and so that's it that that's the line no no this will not do because you know the woman almost like she she does desperately need this help and so and so she almost starts to reach out to penelope but then her ego gets in the way and she's like no 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 this will not do and yep. she walks out so this this that character is not an important character to this story. She does show up in the story um, two other times, and oh. she she does become um, fair somewhat important later on in the trilogy. But that's yeah, that's yeah. a ways away. <laughs> <laughs> and I love um, her name is Honoria. <laughs> it's an old that's Victorian nice. name, oh, and it, nice. I just thought it was perfect for this <laughs> this woman. All right. Um, you say a little bit further on in the novel that Penelope is waiting for, she feels that there's a bigger thing waiting to be found. And what is that that's coming her way? She feels that there's something coming her way that's very big. And she uh, makes a practice of finding lost things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what is it she feels that's very big that's coming her way? Well, um, it's not, I don't make a really big deal about it, but there is something that runs in Penelope's family. So it and it does come out in other stories, but I do try to keep it subtle is there's there's like an instinct, a gut feeling that Penelope tends to get. And and later in the story, um, her her ability to have visions and stuff comes out through um, throughout the story. But and I don't I don't clarify it in this book, but in right. In future stories, um, which is one you'll read pretty soon, <laughs> um, her grandmother had had just this sense. It's not like they're not psychic, but it's just they get this sense of things. They're they're just a little. Their foot is kind of over the, that line. Between, intuition, maybe. 
backwards. Yeah, it's like a it's like a little bit more special than most people's intuition. Right. You know, it's very very subtle, but it's definitely there that they get feelings that other people don't. They can see things that other people don't. But um, and so that's that's kind of that is Penelope just. You know, she's had these crap cases. All she's doing is finding like lost, lost pets. dogs. <laughs> and, um, and she just has this feeling that a bigger case is coming her way. And um, do you want, I, I don't know. Are, are we doing or... I'm sorry, what? Nothing in particular? It is, yeah. There's a special spark. Uh, uh, the spark of the, is the, or the uh, organic uh, power. Um, uh, elements of this universe and um and there's they're kind of like batteries but but there's normal sparks and then there's special sparks that are very rare and i probably i won't go into too much detail because it is a spoiler but but um yeah she she's going to end up on a path to finding this special spark ah that's good all Secret right spark all right a little bit later on in your book, you introduce a character called the Pyro. The <laughs> Pyro. Describe the Pyro's death scene, if you will, because that is a fascinating way for him to die. Yeah. Uh, what was his name, by the way? Arseny Vladimir Bortsevich. That's a cool name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know, I I loved that. I looked up um, Slavic names, and when I saw Arseny. I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like ar arson, arsony. I'm like, it's a real name. And so I had to name my pyro arson. <laughs> and um, he's a very special character, dear to my heart. He was the first character I came up with for this story. Oh, really? And yeah. Oh, and um, yeah. So um, I'm surprised it, uh, you know. It, I would have thought know. Penelope was the first character you came up no. with. The pyro was, huh? Penelope took a while. Penel I knew I was going to have a, a female um, detective. I right. did know that, but that was about it. That's all I knew about Penelope. You know, wow. she she um, she slowly came to me <laughs> through the writing. I went back and changed a lot um, when I was writing it. But but with the pyro, oh, my gosh, that character was just crystal clear from the very right. beginning. I knew about this character so his death scene is he he's been a pyro for a very long time i mean it was his job in the military then later when he started working with sean o'connell for the establishment at the, um on the equinox uh in, in the equinox brigade um so th i mean that's what he does he catches things on fire and so he's just he he's he's a little crazy though and <laughs> i go into why he's crazy what caused him to to go insane but he just you know he he just kind of becomes this his craziness just brings him into this one track mind of he just he needs to create these bigger and bigger fires and so this is this is his biggest one he's he never hurts anybody. He just burns down like empty buildings, but it's this huge warehouse. It's got dynamite and petrol. And I mean, it's just, it's huge. And he's dancing around, sloshing the fuel around. Oh, I just love this scene. <laughs> um, smoking a, a cigar and he, um, He's that standing. seems dangerous to smoke a cigar around all those explosives. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, all those fumes, right? So um, he he puts a uh, oh, I can't think of what the word is. Um, oh, he puts a fuse near the end of his cigar. I I loved this little detail so that <laughs> when he gets down to the fuse and he puffs, 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 and it starts to spark, and then he throws it over his shoulder. And he just stands there feeling the fire at his back. And he's just like <laughs> giggling like, <laughs> like a little kid. And then, you know, then he starts to walk away and he's he's anticipating the moment. He's waiting for a special moment to turn around and see it. And so he does and he's just like, oh, my gosh, this is glorious. It's the biggest <laughs> fire I've ever created. Um, but then... He, you know, his ears pick up on something and he knows he needs to step back because he's he set up dynamite in the right. middle of this warehouse. 
And so he knows he needs to get further back, but his shoelace is untied. Oh no. He bends down to tie his shoelace. He stepped on a dandelion and he's holding the dandelion in his hand. You know, this is his his craziness, right? He's just so right. pointed. So then his attention is on this dead dandelion. <laughs> and then he can't he 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 realizes that he's not going to get away and the oh, warehouse okay. explodes and and he um he's looking at the dead dandelion and then the next thing he knows he's, he's standing vaporized. in front of the gates of hell in a long <laughs> line to the gates of hell that's that's the pyro's death scene all right the next character introduced is sergeant heathrow jennings mm -hmm. I'd like to know what he's like as a man and a police sergeant. Last time you said that he had a hard time letting things go. And if you would give some examples of that, please. So um, he he um, he works really hard as a police officer. He works terribly hard, too much. I mean, no social life. You know, it's it's kind of I mean, we've seen these tropes, right? Right. Um, you know, he he's obsessed with the pyro. He's he really wants to find the pyro. And in in the process, he he grows a deep respect for the pyro because he can't catch the pyro. <laughs> no one can catch this guy. And yep. um, and so as a you know, he just works. He works a lot. He kind of doesn't know how to have a social life at this point. You know, it's it's kind of the the downworld spiral of, you know, I know, I know the type you work, you work, you work. And then suddenly it's like, OK, you're not social. And then when you do have the chance to be social, you don't know how. <laughs> so nope. he's he's um, at first, I feel like um, he, he might be a, a little on the flat side. He does grow, though. Um, but he, um, you know, he he didn't stand up for himself when his partner took um, credit for um, finding, putting all these cases together for the pyro. He didn't stand up for himself when the guy and took credit. Did the work? He did the work. He did the work. The other guy took the credit. He didn't stand up for himself. So the other guy became inspector. Now that guy's his boss. Mm -hmm. And he just he won't stand up for himself and he but at the same time, it's like he won't accept that he won't stand up for himself. So he's just like grinding away in his mind about how that inspector position should be his and he just can't let go of anything. He can't let go of the pyro even after the pyro's dead. He oh, still wants to be looking into the pyro. <laughs> no, no. If I can't find the pyro because the pyro is dead, I'll find out why the pyro is dead. Because <laughs> it doesn't make sense that the pyro. Right. I mean, yes, he's a crazy maniac, but a pyromaniac killing themselves in their own fire is just unheard of. And right. so that's kind of the first mystery of the story. As a man, he's a very he's a very respectful man. Um, he's really kind to people. He likes to, he um, definitely likes to help people, but it's kind of funny because he'll be assertive with something like the, the water isn't working in his apartment. So he, he writes this note to his super saying, you know, you got to fix the water in my flat. But then it's like, please thank you with a smiley face you know so he's like assertive but then he has to he feels he has to back off and so right. he's he's kind of that kind of person and he believes in the everything mystical, the occult everything <laughs> everything the occult <laughs> magic every religion possible every god that's ever been you know he believes in everything outside of himself he's, he's kind constantly of a conflicted conflicted character mm -hmm. yeah yeah yeah. All right. Um, let's see. Penelope, going back to Penelope, Penelope, Penelope has a pocket watch that's engraved with the words, time reveals all things. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And um, what's the significance of that? Or time well, reveals all is what it says, right? Yeah, time reveals all. So um, I think it's... Um, it's her grandfather's way of telling her to be patient. <laughs> She's, you know, be patient. Things are going to be okay. But at the same time, so um, Sean O'Connell is a time traveler. And although there is not, um, time travel is not going to come in heavily. Wait, in she doesn't know that though, right? 
She doesn't know that he, um, he's, to, no, she, well, he, he's told her it? stories. Right. He's told her stories and she thinks the stories were just to entertain her. But, you know, so, so, um, Penelope. The truth, they were really true, right? They were really true. Yeah. And Penelope's <laughs> mother is actually from another time. So, um, yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, this stuff, it doesn't, this, this story doesn't, um, it, these things are mentioned, but this story is not the story that focuses on that stuff. That's going to be later. Okay. Although I don't plan on going too strongly into time travel. I have, I have, my universe has rules about time travel. I don't really? know if they're, I don't well, know I if they're um, new ideas or not. I have not read stories about time travel, but my, there are very strict rules about time travel in my universe. And okay. so it exists, but it's very difficult to do. And it's very hard on a person. And so, um, and, and uh, I go into Clarence W. McGillicuddy is a time traveling bounty hunter. And I go into, in, and in this story, I go He's into- He's a very cool character, by the way. Thank you, I love that character. I love all my characters, <laughs> right, you know? <laughs> um, and, uh, and so um, I, I reveal some of the issues with time travel with him. Uh, with, yeah, he doesn't even, he doesn't know his birthday. He doesn't, he doesn't remember where he came from. He doesn't, doesn't even know his, what the W stands for in his name. Right. Right. You know, because um, time travel does that to a person's brain. All right. What is the significance behind the old man who's behind the clockwork raven? The significance, huh? Yeah. So, um, well, Who he's... He? Um, I'm sorry, what? Who is he at first? At first? Yeah. Um, do, uh, he's, he's in unreality. So there's a parallel yeah. universe called unreality where all the things go that people have stopped believing in. Right. And he um, has a raven, a uh, clockwork raven. It's uh, flesh and bone in unreality, but when it goes into reality, it becomes clockwork. And so... Um, now, he never travels into reality, I take it. He, um, that's, that's later. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, let's go back to his significance. This is a so story. his significance. Well, he's a he's a, he's the first um, antagonist. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to reveal too much. Okay. So he's the first antagonist. He's um he's spot he's sending his clockwork raven to spy on Penelope because he knows about Penelope background. He knows about her goggles, and he knows that she is capable of finding the the secret spark and he doesn't want her finding the secret spark ah because okay. yeah i oh i almost said something that i don't <laughs> it's okay i don't know if these are you know if these are the kind of interviews that can have spoilers or not i'm not <laughs> well we'll save it for maybe next year. time right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right explain if you will the animosity between inspector boring who's a really cool character too yeah the bad yeah. character is Even cool though, character. Yeah. But and Penelope and how would eggs are on. So um, his animosity is that the O'Connell family has been private detectives forever. There's there was Sean and then there was her parents and now it's her. And they just, you know, they they are great at what they do. And so often they have um, solved a case before the police have. And so that's where that animosity comes from. It's like the, you know, it's like stay away from the O'Connells. Don't give them any information, but they find the information anyway. And I hope to go into some short stories of mysteries that, you know, okay. I kind of started dabbling in that a little bit. Um, oh. You know, I don't want to fall into tropes. So I'm, I, I write sparingly in the mystery stories, but. Anyway, well, um, all right. How's yeah. an egg Penelope on? <laughs> well, um, he gets in her face, so she goes to the Rusty Cog, which is a basically a police bar where people, where detectives and stuff go, and to find a case because she's she's broke. She needs a job. She knows the bartender. The bartender knows her, and um, so she goes in because even though like there's 
some police are willing to be like, yeah, yeah, we'll, right, we'll right. get you on this little case that we don't want to deal with kind of thing. So that's what she's banking on is that she can she can find someone to throw her a bone, you know, throw her a case. Um, and uh, so he gets in her face when he realized uh, Inspector Boring gets in her face wow. when he realizes who she is. And he just he's so mean. This this character is just he's such a nasty <laughs> character. I mean, he, he's one of those people that he finds someone's weakness and he'll just he'll just keep poking, you know, he and, bored so, and um, and she's she's pretty vulnerable at that point. And, and so um, she she runs out crying and stuff. But later what eggs her on is that she sees she knows uh, she and Heathrow meet. They become friends. They share right. their stories with each other. So she she has this I she knows that um, Heathrow lost the inspector position too boring. And she's just she tries to get Heathrow to stand up for himself. She's like, this is ridiculous. Just basically like stand up for yourself. Um, and and just each time she comes around boring, boring's just horrible. He's horrible to Heathrow. He's horrible <laughs> to her. He just likes to kick people when they're down. And and anybody in a lower lower position than he, he just he just likes to rub their noses in the fact <laughs> he's rubbing Heathrow's nose in the fact that Heathrow is not inspector. He's um, he's just throwing his weight around. And um, and another scene is, is that Heathrow and Penelope um, they they think they figure out why the pyro got killed. They have some idea. Right. That, oh, that was kind of a spoiler. Spoiler <laughs> alert! Oh. Um, spoilers! Uh, yeah, so um, they, they find the pyro's boot and they figure, they think they figure out why he ended up getting blown up by his own fire. And they take that information to Boring. And Boring wants nothing to do with it because Penelope was involved. Simply uh -huh. because Penelope was involved. Oh, and he told Heathrow... The pyro case is closed. Don't 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 do any more with the pyro case. But he threw ah, it away. So it just eggs it eggs her on to just um, keep. She just keeps trying to stand up to this guy because he throw isn't nobody's standing up to this guy. And she and does, right? She does. She does. Right. Tell us about the plague doctor. What role does he play in your story? So the plague doctor is uh, Mortimer Pestle. He has a little plague mouse that lives in his pocket, <laughs> his inside <laughs> pocket, and her name is Masala. And a Mortimer Pestle, he's an apothecary um, plague doctor. He always, you never see him. He's always in plague plague garb. And you never um, see his face. You never see his face. Not yet. Really? You will later. Okay. okay. Um, I promise. <laughs> but he um. So he can communicate with the Clockwork Raven, and <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> they kind of look like each other. You know, they both have beaks. So, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. so um, his, his 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 first scene is when Penelope runs out of the rusty cog and slips on a piece of zucchini. She cracks her head open, passes out. Um, the Clockwork Raven goes to the Plague Doctor and Mortimer Pestle basically saves Penelope um, and takes her to his apothecary. And um, his role is, he's just, he's kind of, kind of, he's not, he's not a huge character in this story, but he's a catalyst. So he's supposed to help um, keep Penelope from <laughs> going on this at this journey to find this spark so so the old man in uh, uh, unreality and the raven in who can travel to reality right gets mortimer mortimer pestle in because he's supposed to keep her at his apothecary but he's he doesn't <laughs> she, <laughs> she leaves and okay. uh, and he's trying to you know he he's kind of trying to in a very soft way be like you know, you need to rest. You just need to rest when really it's like, we don't want you finding this thing. <laughs> and uh, and so he's just he's kind of a he's a character that interacts with the clockwork raven. A minor we, character, we, we, but pivotal in a way, right? He's yeah, yeah, he's, kind of, he's, a, yeah, yeah. he's a pivotal character. He's 
he helps um, some scenes transition. He he's he's a character that explains some things that you know. Right. And and he comes into other stories later too. Okay. All so right. nothing. Uh, it might seem like there's a character that like oh you know it's just kind of this character that appeared and like, now they're gone. They all come back. There is no character okay. that is unimportant. Waste no characters, right? <laughs> waste, waste, <laughs> waste not. All one. right. Now the name of the book is the Everstream Chronicles, Book One. And this is author A. Karina, the, pardon me, this is author <laughs> Jude Matlich Hall. Yeah. And uh, so can you hold up your book one more time? Yeah. The Eversteam Chronicles by Jude Matlich Hall. All right. Good. Yeah. Good and going to be having another book coming out. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Got a short, an Eversteam anthology coming out. Right. Yeah. That's a good. A bunch of stories by me and a couple by some friends. Now, Jude, uh, give them your web address. www.judemadelichhall.com. And your Facebook and address? Is JMH Writers and Illustrators Group. All right. I also, um, there was something else I was going to talk about. Uh, I'm also on Twitter, TikTok, Instagram. Okay. I'm everywhere. LinkedIn. <laughs> You're yeah. ubiquitous, in other words, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm on YouTube. Check out my YouTube channel. Oh, yeah. What's the name of your YouTube channel? It's just under my name, Jude Madelich Hall. Jude Madelich yeah. Hall. All right. As long as you spell my name right. <laughs> All right. So the book is published by White Cat Publications, which is www.whitecatpublications.com. And until our next interview, which will be next week at Wednesday, mm -hmm. namaste. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you.